Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to Leading Our Own Way. We're up to part three of this week's episode of the show. We're diving even deeper into our conversation with this week's guest. Let's continue exploring their inspiring journey. If you've missed part one and two, definitely go back and catch up. Also, if you're not subscribing, please, please subscribe. Enjoy the rest of the show. See you soon. Hmm. So going yeah. back to your, um, the, just briefly, the separation between your mum and your father, mm -hmm. um, when they separated, uh, mm -hmm. did your dad disappear from your life or was he still very much around? Um, um, I want to say he disappeared um, just because he's probably, more than likely, I believe he moved out of state at that point. Oh. Um, did I miss that element? Yeah, I believe I did. Because you know yeah. every, every you know kid loves to have his dad around. Um, sure. I, I did miss him at that point, but he was kind of, you know, at those times and you know in days you had to accept what you had to accept. There was nothing in the world you could do to change it, and I never ever ever wanted to hold that against him, because what that did, and I don't know at that point, I don't even remember if uh, if that time um, kind of put me somewhere mentally. I think it did because I think I did a little bit of rebellion. Uh, I was a little rebellious and just trying to kind of find exactly what that is. Um, I didn't necessarily hold it against him. I didn't. And I'm grateful for that, that I didn't hold that in my heart. Um, um, I didn't hold it to a large degree in his heart. Of course, I missed that element of fatherhood. But everything that I've learned in my life, um, I can contribute to him, yes, um, whether it's positive or negative. And I always say this, and I make point of this, is sometimes people will go through different things and they find a way to blame the person and blame the person. My perspective was this. Um, perhaps that person wasn't in your life because of a per particular reason. Maybe that person mm -hmm. didn't understand it for themselves and they couldn't teach you. Yeah. Who knows what your life would have turned out if, if that person was that much more influential. So if that person hasn't figured out what life was all about, what is he going to really teach you? Mm. You know what I mean? So, yeah, for sure. you know, um, uh, uh, leading your own way in my perspective is just that, you know, even when your parents to some degree have dropped the ball certain areas, times in your life, it's still up to you to not hold that against them to that to that degree, but move in the direction where you're healed. And of course, that's a process. You have to mature to that point. But yeah. it is available to you. I didn't have conscious in, really in my mind to, to not like him, to hate him. No, he had a journey he had to go on himself. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful that I at least had the mind to say, okay, so I don't want to do that. I'm going to keep music at the forefront of my life. I'm going to move in that direction and be better. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, it was hard. It was difficult. And I didn't understand it at that point. But as you age and as, you, as life kind of goes on, you can understand as an adult why adults make certain decisions. When you become mature and understand what that is, sometimes it's difficult. For me, it was just like, yeah, I understand. So it did affect me to some degree, but I'm grateful it did not affect me to a point um, um, where it just takes me out. And, and I believe, and I'll say this, and I hope I'm not uh, putting anybody's businesses out, business out there. You know, to some degree, my father had fathered children. Um, um, and sometimes those same children can hold, well, sometimes the perspective of those children or the life that they have can be held up by the, the, the forgiveness or unforgiveness of that sibling or that father or that parent that wasn't there. And sometimes it'll, it'll even stifle you on how you live your life, right? So you're looking for somebody to blame for mm -hmm. your life turning out the way it's turned out. And I'm sorry, but at some point, when do you decide to live your life when do you decide to live your life and not allow what has been a part of your life to dictate where your life goes? So for me, I'm grateful just for mine. Um, and it had to be only by the grace of God that, that my mind matured in that way. My father is not here. He has transcended. He has, um, he is in the spiritual realm. I cannot hold him accountable for anything 
during at this point in my life. Right. So I have to be better. I have to understand that maybe he did not understand what that was. So I'm not going to let that dictate my life. And then my life turns out to be as crazy as that was for him at that point. No, that wouldn't be fair to me. No. Right. You know what I mean? Or mm -hmm. because you have children. So you know how generational curses happen or generational mindsets happen. It just keeps going on and on and on. When do you stop and say, wait, I'm not going to think like that. Wait a minute. I don't know why it didn't happen. Let me find a way to heal myself and get to a point of where leading your own way. Thank you for, 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 for the name of your podcast, leading your own way pushes you to think that leading your own way. Is it a task? Is it hard? Yep. But I am not going to allow my life to be dictated by someone else dropping the ball in my life. I should be mature enough to understand how that works. So I'm not going to make it worse by contributing to the mindset and kind of perpetuating it onto my children and perpetuating it onto my life. And it kind of goes on and on and on and on. At some point, you have to stop. So it did affect me. Yeah. But at some point in your life, for me, um, I had to not allow that to dictate what the pace of my future was going to be yeah yeah i think the reason why i asked that question because i was picturing you on that staircase of you you music and you're not wanting you know your friend to hear you mm -hmm. and uh, I, I think that was around you said that was 16 years old and i mm -hmm. think you said early in your in the pre-chat when we met a few weeks ago that they separated around the you know give or take 13 years old mm -hmm. and when you don't have when you've had a man in your life and you've had that role model and you've mm. give, been given the gift of music, mm -hmm. all of a sudden that's not there. Um, is that part of, um, maybe we're digging too deep here, but I was thinking mm. maybe that was the, the, the build up, the lack of confidence, maybe the, the shyness around the, the music talent that you had mm -hmm. that was hidden essentially, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it, it could have been, I, I, I can't contribute that to, 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 to him not being there. No. It's just yeah. for, I, I can. I was a shy guy. I mean, in the eighties, you know, nobody was saying "Yo, sing." Like was saying that, not to me. It was saying "Shut up." Like I don't want to hear that. <laughs> I want to hear that. Um, um, you know. But you get to, you know, church was a very, very good outlet because I can really express myself in church. You know, church was it. I can sing. Um, of course, I, I was a little shy enough to do that. But your shyness is probably mainly because nobody's ever told you that you could really do it. Mm. That's probably where your shyness come from. For for me, you know, if I shut up, I mean, I don't think they meant it, you know, like don't sing anymore. It's just, it's, you know, come on, give me a break. It's like the <laughs> child, you know, that gets their first clarinet from uh, from the from the band and he wants to come home and practice and he's in his room. Uh, they're in their room just blowing the clarinet trying to learn it and you're like my god I wish he's be quiet but you know it's just like that you're just trying to learn um, so my dad being there he was definitely okay during the time that I was around my dad um, he he was impressed because in, fun fact you know probably one of the things that nobody's ever known is I did have classical training but my classical mm -hmm. training was overtaken because um, I couldn't necessarily be classically trained by reading the notes. So my time with classical training was very short because most times if I was in practice or I had practice with the, with the lesson that I was getting that day, she would play whatever she wanted to play. And then because of my ear, I would play back to her what she played and uh she was like what well, what note did you read that it, she said it just sounded a little different so i said was i wrong she was like no i it, it just wasn't what i played <laughs> so oh. so she wanted me to play it again <laughs> when i played it again i would give it a little something different and um, she was like, well, what note was that you read? And I didn't know what the hell note it was. I'm just depending on my ear. It was very hard and difficult to continue that on. She eventually said, yeah, yeah, he plays by ear. Um, will he ever be trained to play notes? Hmm, possibly. But at this time, my spirit and my ear was so free, uh, playing notes kind of, you know, kind of put me in a box and I did, I didn't enjoy it. Um, so she kind of like 
told my mother to save her fifteen dollars a session and just not have it there. So she was a phenomenal lady. I can't remember her name, um, but she was a pianist. Ooh, she could play. First song that I ever playing played that she taught me was Whitney Houston, "The Greatest Love of All." Yeah. Wow. So I didn't read the notes. So she played it. She played it, and I played it right back to her and put something else in it. And she was like, Whew. "I don't know where you got that from, but I didn't play that." <laughs> But she was absolutely impressed. <laughs> isn't yeah? I was going to say, isn't that more of a talent to have that ear than it, it would be it to is, read the notes? It's so many different gospel artists. Still, got so many different gospel uh, musicians are ear and hear orientated. So, mm. can they play notes? Mm, some of them can, um, because those notes are going to kind of put you in a box, in my opinion. And if you could have a great ear and play notes. Oh, you're getting all the gigs, all of them, all of them, because it gives the feel and it gives the structure both at the same time. If you can do one, you're more likely going to get a gig. If you can play outright play, you're going to get a gig. But that playing note um, and reading sheet music, that's going to get you the gig. Absolutely. No questions asked. So for me, more or less than anything, um, I'm going to get the gigs that's going to be free, yeah, that you're going to have to kind of go and improv the whole thing, and I enjoy those. <laughs> Can you read the notes now? <laughs> I, I could read a very, very small amount. I never disciplined myself to really understand the notes. I can read Trouble Staff. You know, I can read all of it. I know what the notes are. It's the I can't get my brain past what I hear. So yeah. you have to shut your brain off and look at the note and play it. I couldn't figure out that. I, I was too free of a of a of a player to just play notes. Yeah, Go- gospel. The gospel um, journey was quite uh, big for you, wasn't it? During yeah. those years, mm-hmm. I was a part of, um, of course, the church, um, which was yeah. very influential throughout my music career. Um, um, I played with um, my first gospel gig was was his courts was, was of course at church and then i got into playing quartet music which is a style of uh, southern gospel with quartet singing um that was fun and then i got on my own with gospel music and i was doing a lot of praise and worship and uh, after that kind of went left for me not left but i just kind of felt that i wanted to do something a little more i always stayed inspirational then I got into R and B, so gospel was the start of it for me. Yep. Who would be your favorite uh, R and B artist uh, of all time? <sighs> of all time, that's yeah. hard because I'm. That's real hard. Uh, um, so I like a plethora of of different artists, um, from Joe Thomas to uh, Marvin Gaye to. Marvin Gaye. <sighs> to Michael Jackson, to Brian McKnight, to uh, um, producers, you know, like Rodney Jerkins, to producers like Teddy Riley, to... Uh, Al Green? Al Green, yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah, that soul, Green. that soul, all of those guys like that, not necessarily... Um, like I'm, I'm not necessarily artist driven as opposed to sound driven. Mm. Um, the sound of the records are important. Marvin Gaye has probably one of the most profound sounds. Mm-hmm. Um, Michael Jackson, <sighs> and Lenny Kravitz. Yes. The 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 vibes, those sorts of things. I love those. Um, so I'm not necessarily artist driven. I'm sound driven. So I listen to basically anything, and and, and those are yeah. just a couple of them. Yeah, I went to the um, I think it was um, Marvin Gaye. Yeah, I went to the All Star Game in Los Angeles 2004, mm-hmm. and um, his do- it was 20 years since he sang at halftime show. Uh, mm-hmm. I think it was 1984. He sang the uh, halftime show at the All Star Game in LA. Yeah. So the tribute to that, his daughter sang with him on stage. But Marvin Gaye was obviously a 
sadly passed away right. at that point. Mm -hmm. But his daughter sang, so that the clip of him in the All-Star game 20 years be was behind her, mm -hmm. and she was singing on the stage in front of us. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, my God, it was so magical. Miss like it Nat was, King Cole and, uh, and his daughter Natalie Cole. Say that again, sorry. I said, much like Nat King Cole and Natalie Cole. Oh, I, it, it, did they do the same thing? They did the same thing. You had oh, Donnie yeah. Hathaway and Layla Hathaway. Right. They didn't necessarily do a halftime show, but those are Natalie Cole and and uh, and her dad, Nat King Cole, they did the Christmas thing together. Whew. Right. It's magical, Don isn't it? Ma oh, Natalie it Cole. It makes the... Mm. It, it, even now my arms are sticking up like it was just weird it was kind of eerie at the same time though yeah yeah I, I've Do heard you know like mean? those two Natalie Cole and Layla Hathaway singing their dad's songs like those are ooh, those are absolutely great moments that you know forever and I'm in my heart and for having my mind mm. I still listen to uh, to Layla Hathaway today and Layla Hathaway got the pipes on her like her dad just absolutely insane and yeah. she has a nostalgia to her so you know again music for me in that way when i'm hearing those they just do something for me it's just phenomenal what was that um i love al green because i'm a big fan of uh, yeah. justin timberlake yeah and justin timberlake sang with al green and um, mm -hmm. what was the famous song al green did dun, dun, love and happiness Yes, that's a good one, but I don't think that's the song I'm thinking of. Uh, since we've been together. Oh, mm -hmm. that's, yeah, that's a good Love one, but it's not the one I was thinking of. Okay. Give, us, give, us some, give us something on that one, though. That was a good one. Can you give us something on that one? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> since, uh, 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 since we've been together. Mm, 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 loving you forever. See, that was what I need. <laughs> I can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> That's the one. No, it is that one. That is the one. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. That yeah. was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, graduating high school, mm -hmm. going to early adult adulthood. Mm -hmm. How did that look for you? It looked like I was trying to find my way because the music wasn't happening as much as I thought it was going to be. So yeah, I decided it wasn't signed. <laughs> nah, <laughs> mad, <laughs> mad, mad. So uh, I decided to go to a school um, called the Institute of Audio Research, which back in those days, that was the school to go to if you wanted to do engineering or have anything to do in the industry. Um, that was where all of the uh the top music houses in uh New York City was getting its engineers from. Um so I went to the Institute of Audio Research and um I learned so much there. Although I had a lot of knowledge before I went, but it was it was filtered through my brain and it wasn't filtered through the collegiate uh level. So I decided to uh go there and graduated from there um with um with a certificate in uh, audio engineering and uh, it was at those times where computer music was just being introduced so I learned a lot about MIDI in in its beginning stage I mm -hmm. learned a lot about uh, computer mi music in its beginning stage um, in mixing and mastering that, those were my bread and butter I love to do the mixing and the mastering and I still do that to this day um, um, editing and I, at that time it wasn't computer editing it was reel to reel editing so you were splicing tape and all of that sort of stuff so um, yeah. that's what that happened then um, I had a, a child in 1998 uh, my first daughter my first daughter was born in <laughs> during those times if, if you're if you're coming up in those times you were um, uh, going to going to intern you wasn't going to get no money You'll be lucky to get bus and train fare from Jersey to New York every day, and um, that was the that was the time where you was more likely going to be getting coffee and all of that sort of stuff. I had a child; I couldn't subject myself to that. Not that I was better than anybody else, but uh, I wasn't going, you know, get milk money and pamper money from uh, from from doing errands, you know, trying to, you know, get a career in music. So I went to work. Yeah. I still did the IAR thing um, and I went to work and took care of my child and um, just kind of tried to do it on the freelance tip 
um, and just do music around the way. And um, it just matriculated into so many different things. I, I guess your life that you take, that you choose to take, it kind of works for you when it works for you. And um, it worked at that point. And um, um, IER was where I was from 19, at 1998. No, no, that's 97. I'm sorry. 1997, that was IER. 98 was when my daughter was born. And um, there you go. <laughs> yeah, wow. Yeah. You, you were pretty young then, weren't you? How old were you Oof. in 98? 1998, I was about 20. Yeah. 20, 20, That's... 20. 20 and yeah. you had a child not long after that as well, didn't you? Mm hmm. After that, I had another child. Um, no, 1998, 2003. 2003. Okay. I had another child. Um, and yeah, was it 2003? I thought it was 2001. <laughs> Was it that? No, my third child was born in 2003. Yeah, 2001 was my middle son. <laughs> Charge it to my head, not my heart. <laughs> yeah, 2001. You know it better than I do. Uh, yeah, 2001. I had my son in 2003. I had uh, uh, another child. Yeah. I was married at two, in 2002, though. So yeah, wow. you see how that, that short span of window happened? It's like... Yeah. It's like you're trying to figure life out. Um, music was always there. You're just trying to figure life out. And, and when life happens, um, from the choices that you make, you have to rebound and you have to figure out what you what you got to do. And mm -hmm. um, my decisions, maybe I should, I'll say, that, maybe my decisions um, may have um, slowed down the level of music or career that I wanted to have in it to it. But um, everything's happens for a reason. I don't look at it like that way to some degree, I'm grateful that it's just available for me to use for my peace. And yeah. maybe it's just a gift that I have for me um, that I wanted to share with the world. So I don't look at it as uh, um, a bad thing necessarily. Um, I've definitely rebounded from it and um, I'm living great and I'm enjoying life at this point. So that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So because. So you separated from your partner, your wife at that point. Mm -hmm. um, where did your music direction go then? Music direction was still now. I was actually really heavily into the quartet scene and gospel music. Yeah. Um, I stayed there for, hmm, I don't know, a couple of years. And I decided at that time that I wanted to do solo stuff. So, and then I got to doing, I got three gospel records that I did after I, I assisted them creating a gospel quartet record for the group. And after I did that, I left and on, went on my own to did gospel music on my own. Yeah. 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 Cool. The, um, the next part of your life you met, um, uh, as you mentioned earlier, the, the, the love of your life, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, you, you were with your uh, wife for how long? For 21 years. Yeah, wow. And that's what your third your that's third my third child. Yep. Third child, yeah. Yep. Kiara um, Kiara was born in twenty or two thousand three. Yeah. And talk can you because life series life seriously kind of changed, didn't it, mm -hmm. in the last few years, um, which has contributed to your journey now. Mm -hmm. uh, probably even more so, right? Mm-hmm. Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.